So we are going to talk about why the Gaussian integral trick is unique. Now you might have seen this method for evaluating the Gaussian integral, which is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. One way we can do this is we can multiply the integral by itself. So if i equals this integral, then i squared equals the integral of e to the minus x squared dx times the integral of e to the minus y squared dy. So these two are the same integral, I've just written the second one with a different variable, y instead of x. We can combine these two integrals to get the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared times e to the minus y squared dx dy. And the key here is that we can combine e to the minus x squared times e to the minus y squared into e to the minus x squared plus y squared. So we've written this entire integral here in terms of x squared plus y squared. And from here, we can do a polar coordinate substitution. So what that looks like is we let x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and if we multiply by the Jacobian in this case, which is r, this integral turns into the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus r squared r dr d theta. So what happens here is x squared plus y squared in polar coordinates is the same thing as r squared. So e to the minus x squared plus y squared becomes e to the minus r squared, and then using the Jacobian, dx dy equals r dr d theta. We change the bounds here so that r goes from 0 to infinity and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. What that basically means is if we look at polar coordinates, r is the distance away from the origin and theta is the angle. So we're saying take all the angles from 0 to 2 pi, that's all the way around the circle, and then take all the distances from 0 out to infinity. So this is just saying that we integrate over the entire 2D space like we were doing originally. And from here, the inside integral, we can use the u substitution u equals minus r squared because we have this r out in front that lets us complete the substitution and we're able to compute the integral from there. But we can do this process if the function is e to the minus x squared in the inside of the integral. Can we do it if we replace e to the minus x squared with some other function f of x? So if we want to apply this same trick to a function other than e to the minus x squared, let's see what that process would look like. We start with the original integral, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx, or some arbitrary function f. First we multiply that integral by itself. So we get the integral of f of x times the integral of f of y. And then we can combine these two to get the integral over all of 2d space of f of x times f of y dx dy. Now the next step is supposed to be that we substitute polar coordinates. x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. But the reason that we were able to do that in the Gaussian integral case is that we could write this product f of x times f of y as a function of x squared plus y squared. And then when we go to polar coordinates, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So we can substitute that in, and this gives us an easy way to do a substitution, u equals minus r squared. So if we want to be able to continue from here, then we need to have this product, f of x times f of y, being equal to some function of x squared plus y squared. That's what lets us do the polar coordinate substitution. And let's call that function g. So what we need for the Gaussian integral trick to work is that we have some function f, where f of x times f of y equals g of x squared plus y squared, where g is just some other function. Now to figure out which functions let us use the Gaussian integral trick, we need to know which functions f satisfy the equation f of x times f of y equals g of x squared plus y squared for some function g. So let's say we have some f that satisfies this equation, and see what information we can get. You might start out by trying to plug in a few specific values for x and y. You might try what if x equals 0, or what if x equals y, or what if x equals minus y, and things like that. But it's hard to get a lot of information out of this kind of approach 
because g can be any arbitrary function. So it's hard to pin down specific values. But there is another approach we can use, which is taking derivatives. This equation has to hold for all numbers x and y, which means these two sides are functions of x and y that are equal at every single point. That means their derivatives also have to be equal. So let's try taking derivatives and see if we can figure anything out that way. If we take the partial derivative on both sides with respect to x, let's see what we get. f of y is a constant with respect to x, so taking the derivative over here gives us f prime of x times f of y. And then on the right side, the partial derivative with respect to x, we're going to use the chain rule here. So the derivative of the outside function is g prime of x squared plus y squared. And then the derivative of the inside with respect to x is just 2x. And we can do the same thing if we take the derivative with respect to y. The steps are going to be the same. That time we get f of x times f prime of y equals g prime of x squared plus y squared times 2y. Now we have two different equations that have g prime in them, so let's see if we can put them together. Both of these equations have 2 times g prime of x squared plus y squared. And let's see what that equals in each of the equations. For the first equation, 2 times g prime of x squared plus y squared, well that's equal to the left side divided by x, because if we divide by x that's going to isolate this part right here. So this is equal to f prime of x times f of y divided by x. And then on the other hand, in the second equation, we have to divide by y on both sides to get this by itself. So this is equal to f of x times f prime of y, that's this left side, divided by y. And the magic here is that because we can write g prime of x squared plus y squared in two different ways, we're able to remove the g from the equation and get something that's only in terms of f. So we've made some progress. Using derivatives, we're able to completely remove g and just focus on f. But right now, this equation still has two variables in it, which makes it a little difficult for us. It would be nicer if the equation only had one variable. So to do that, what we're going to do is fix a specific value of y. So I'm going to set y equal to y naught. This is just some particular number, but I want to emphasize the fact that we're not varying y at all. We're treating it as a constant, and we're only going to consider the equation in terms of x. So then the equation becomes f prime of x times f of y naught over x equals f of x times f prime of y naught over y naught. Again, this isn't changing the equation at all. I just want to point out that we're choosing a value of y, namely y naught, and we're going to leave it as that specific value for the rest of the computations. So now everything that's in terms of y naught is just a constant, and we're trying to solve an equation in terms of x. So now that we've made y naught a constant, if you're familiar with differential equations, you might notice that this is now a separable differential equation. If you aren't familiar with that, don't worry, we can still go through the steps. Right now we have an f prime in the equation. We're trying to solve for the original function f, so we really want to get rid of this f prime. And the easiest way to do that is to take the integral. But right now we have an f of x on the other side. We don't know what the integral of f of x is. So we kind of want to combine this f prime and f in a way that still lets us take the integral. And one way we can do that is to divide by f of x on both sides of the equation. So on the left side of the equation, we'll get f prime of x over f of x. And the nice thing about this is that we can actually integrate f prime over f because we can use the u substitution, u equals f of x, and then du equals f prime of x dx. So we're able to do the integral of this function right here. So we want to get f prime of x over f of x by itself. First of all, of course, we're going to divide by f of x. So on the left side, we get f prime over f. Now, right now, on the left side, we also have f of y naught and 1 over x. So let's move those to the other side of the equation. That means we're going to multiply by x and divide by f of y naught. So on the right side of the equation, we're getting f prime of y naught over y naught times f of y naught times x. This is our differential equation now. 
And like I just said, we can take the integral on both sides. Now, if we take the integral of f prime over f dx, again, we're going to substitute u equals f of x, du equals f prime of x dx. And so on the left side, we're going to get the integral of one over u times du. And the integral of one over u is natural log of u. So on the left side, we're going to get natural log of f of x, since u equals f of x. Now on the right side, the integral is much simpler because this whole thing right here is a constant. So we're integrating a constant times x. And the integral of x is just 1 half x squared. So on the right side, we get f prime of y naught over 2 y naught f of y naught x squared. And then I'll put the plus c on that right side. Now remember that this entire thing right here is a function of y naught, which means that it's just a constant. So I'm going to call that constant c1 to make it easier to read. Now we have natural log of f of x equals c1 x squared plus another constant, which we'll call c2. Now our goal is to solve for f of x. Right now we have the natural log of f of x. But the way that we get rid of natural log, the way that we cancel it out, is take e to the power of both sides. So if we do that, e to the natural log of f of x will just give us f of x back. And then on the, on the right side, e to the power of this thing gives us e to the c1x squared. And then we're going to multiply that by e to the c2. But e to the power of a constant is just another constant. So we're really multiplying by another constant value, which I'll call c3. So this is the final solution. We have f of x equals c3 times e to the c1x squared. So we just proved that any function f satisfying this equation, f of x times f of y equals g of x squared plus y squared, has to have the form c3 times e to the c1x squared. And this is almost identical to the form that we see in the Gaussian integral, which is e to the minus x squared. So what we've really shown here is that fundamentally, the Gaussian integral trick only works on this type of function. It really only works on these exponentials right here. There is no other type of function that it works on. So ultimately, the Gaussian integral trick is unique. So these functions c3 e to the c1x squared, those are the only types of functions that let us use that polar coordinates trick to write everything in terms of r. Now I want to go through a few of the assumptions that we made during this solution, because we did make a few. The first assumption that we made was when we divided by y0 times f of y0. Of course we can't divide by 0, so this division only works if y0 times f of y0 is not equal to 0. Remember that we're picking a fixed value of y0. We picked some value to stay constant throughout the entire thing. So we don't need this denominator to be non-zero for every value of y0. All we need is that it's non-zero for one value of y0. So the solutions that we're excluding are the solutions where y0 times f of y0 equals zero for all y0. So what kinds of solutions are those? Well, first of all, if y0 isn't equal to zero, then this equation implies that f of y0 equals zero. So this means that f of y0 has to equal zero for all non-zero values. It could only possibly be non-zero at the exact point y0 equals zero. But if this function f is zero everywhere except for at one point, then the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx is definitely going to equal zero. So we aren't really excluding any interesting solutions by making an assumption that this is non-zero in at least one place. Because if it's zero everywhere, then we automatically know that this integral is zero anyway. So we're not really going to use the Gaussian integral trick in that case. Now there's one other assumption, a bigger assumption that we made at the very beginning when we took the derivative. Because of course, you can only take the derivative if your function is differentiable. And there are a lot of very interesting functions that don't have derivatives. In particular, there are some functions where you can't take the derivative, but you can take the integral. And so that whole class of functions we excluded when we assumed that you could take the derivative of f. Now, 
I won't go through the proof in this video, but it turns out that there's a proof that any Riemann integrable function satisfying this equation has to have this exponential form right here. So this result does apply to functions that don't have a derivative. It's just that the proof has to be different. Now the proof in the case where you can't take derivatives is definitely harder, but it's still possible to understand the proof just using some knowledge of calculus. So I've left a link to that proof in the description if you're interested in reading that. I'd also like to give credit to Mariano Suarez Alvarez, who came up with the proof that I used in this video.